Hey guys, I am extremely pixelated today because I am on the third installment of the Build of a Guitar Kit World ES-175 Guitar Kit. Now, if this is the first episode you are seeing in this series, you want to stop right now and you want to go right up there and get your mouse up there and hover around and I will pop up and there will be a, a playlist of the episodes thus far. We started off with episode one, which is an introduction to the kit. I kind of told you why I got to this point. I started off building cigar boxes, license plates, coffee cans, and then doing junk arch tops. And I show you what that looked like, my progression. And then I opened up the Guitar Kit World ES-175 kit. Now, you know, the ES-175 was a classic guitar still built by Gibson, has a Florentine cutaway, which is really nice if you like to play slide guitar and like to get down to the lower frets without doing this. Anyway, TMI. Now, I have been... So the second episode... Let's stay on track, Ken. Okay, I will. The second episode was about what did I have to do to get the guitar ready out of the factory? How much work did I have to put into getting it ready to put a finish on? Now, I'm going to put the finish on before I put the thing together because I got a lot of stuff going on. This is not your normal kit build. You are going to see a guitar come out of this uh, series like you've never seen before. I don't try to copy somebody's guitar. I make my own guitars and this one is going to be historically significant. Now, I want to remind you that the impetus, which is a really big word for, considering what you're fixing to see right now, for the name of this car guitar, which I'm calling the Mississippi Mudslide, was this refrigerator magnet set, especially this one right here that I got at a yard sale about 15 years ago. That is profound. Now, we are going to get into a little theoretical biology. By the way, when I was studying trees early on and discovering all kinds of things like how crane booms and uh, palm trees are structurally similar, similar. One of my favorite reading journals was the Journal of Theoretic Biology in which people have these crazy ideas looking at a leaf spin in the wind or something. Stephen Vogel, love your work. Anyway, they would publish this stuff in there and try to tie it to something structural. It's awesome. Journal of Theoretic Biology. You heard it here first. I know. I know. Okay, now I've hinted along the way in the first two episodes, again, introduction and then uh, prepping for this episode. By the way, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting a finish on this guitar like nothing you've seen before. i got to give credit where credit is due. If you don't know who Ken Parker is and his arch tops, you really want to understand Ken Parker. I'm going to burn up one of my cards giving you a link to his discussion about the development of the archtop guitar over history. You really want to see that. Hey, Ken Parker, love your channel. He's at the opposite end of what I do. Anyway, I am a study of how things move and how structurally dependable they are. Because I've told you my guitars are unique, but above all, they need to be dependable because they got to blues artists and the first time something fails they're done with it yeah it looks cool but it doesn't play so you're done right there so structural integrity and dependability are number one to me let's get into some theoretical biology that that is true only in my brain if this makes any sense to you you need to go get some help but let's start here anything that is loaded it comes under a load, has to have a transitional zone for the load to be buffered. If the load is not buffered, you create a structural point where the load is pinpointed. Say, for example, I'm picking up something with a crane. I let the boom of the crane go against something. Suddenly, the entire load that's on the boom goes right to that point. That's why crane booms fail. That is why the old radio towers used to blow down in windstorms if they weren't anchored properly. So I want you to put that one in the back of your brain. Next thing I want to do without 
getting all I Ching and Kung Fu theater on you. Ignore the nunchucks. I know they're illegal. I don't want tea leaves to enter the situation, but I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about this. I'm going to say the word now twice. Then there's going to be a question, so pay attention. Now and now. So here's the question. What in the world was exactly the same, either singly or collectively, between the first time I said now and the second time I said now? There's an infinitesimal, blah, 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 blah rented lips, blah, blah, infinitesimal number of changes that occurred in me, you, what was on television, what was going on in the planet, I don't even know, all of that. Some people think that each moment in time is reflected by the characteristics of that moment. Uh, yeah, again, back to I Ching and tea leaves. So I want you to consider those things as we move forward here. We're going to, again, we're going to talk about finishing the violin if I ever finish here, but I need you to understand why I got to this point. It's fascinating, and I think it's going to open you up to a whole new world. And yeah, I'm glad I could help you recover your life and your focus. So let's talk about first loading, especially in musical instruments. Do you know what one of these is? Yes, they've been around since probably somewhere late 1500, early 1600. Cremona, Italy is the place to get one of these from, especially if you can get one from that time period. If you do, if you can and you own one or you can afford one, why are you watching my channel anyway? Do you see a resemblance? F hole, F hole. Until Lloyd Lohr joined Gibson in 1921 and they ran him off by 1923, there were no F holes in guitars. They instead had a sound hole. They were arched, okay? But there were no F holes. I personally think that Lloyd Lohr said, you know what? The average American relates F hole with wealth and culture, i.e. a violin. F holes are the worst thing that ever happened to sonic transfer in a guitar. You have the bridge here, picks up sound, and we're going to talk about this in a second, by you rolling your finger, loading the string, and then releasing it. It transfers that sound to the top of the guitar through the bridge, floating bridge, and then it resonates this way and this way. Guess what? As soon as it hits the F holes, it dies. They're not meant for that, but they look cool. So um, then you'll notice that arch tops started to get thinner after people started to put F holes or, or pickups on them. And the reason for that is the thick body of these guitars creates this feedback and vibration that if you look at the guitar while it's feeding back, um, she's in love with me and I feel fine, Beatles, early 60s, the start of that song is actually an arch top feeding back. Go check it out. You know what? I will give you a link to it right up there. Nice bicycle work, Ringo. Okay, so I want to talk about the violin first. And I want you to notice that it's curved. I'm going to do a little experiment here. Ready? Nothing's going to blow up. Relax. And uh, if it does, it won't hit you. I have two pieces of paper here. We're going to talk about resonance and durability. One is a piece of copy paper, like what you would load in your printer at home. The other one is a piece of cardstock, like I would use to put a graphic on a cigar box that I would make a guitar out of. Now, I'm going to get a drink out of the coolest stickered thing you've ever seen in your life. And you've probably done this with a maple seed double seed. Um, that seed type is called a Samura, by the way. Anyway, I'm going to take this. You've done this with a blade of grass. This is the piece of paper. I'm going to grab it like this. I'm going to go like this. Did you hear that? Good. I'll bill you for, a, 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 what do you call it, a hearing test. Now I'm going to take the uh, cardstock, which is approximately double the thickness, 
I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Ooh. I get practically nothing. Why? Well, because the thinner something is, the more it resonates. So, best arch tops in the world, very thin. Is thin usually durable? Answer, no. Is curved and thin durable? Answer is no. The thicker you make the arch top, the less resonance you have. So, did the arch tops get thicker, the soundboard, the top board, as time went on and pickups became more important? Of course. But again, if you go back in history, the best violins have a very thin top. So tell me, answer me this. Why is it that something Ant Antonio Stradivari made in Italy in 1725, how is it still here, hundreds of years later, so sought after and still sounds great when the trick to it the whole secret of it was how thin it was. That's like me wondering how this piece of paper would survive from 1725 over this piece of cardstock. Think that out. I'm going to tell you how it happened in this episode. You have to watch for it. I'm going to show you how to finish a guitar like they did in Italy. Now, to, to set that up a little bit. It's 1725. There is no true value hardware in Cremona, Italy. I'm sorry, I checked. Well, I, I heard that. Anyway, there was no car. There was nothing. There was your shirt, pants, dirt, and the finest violins ever. I don't think they had baseball. I don't think they, they certainly didn't have an iPhone. So, you had to use what you had to make this. I, I, I think that's significant. So, the trick to this is, if I've got something really thin and I want to make it durable, I have to seal it. And that seal has to be something that will keep moisture out for hundreds of years. If you ever notice, you can take your fingernail on a violin and try and push it in, nothing happens. They are so thin, but they are so durable. They put something on that soaked in, sealed the top, and then they did something to put color. Now, remember the part I told you about between now and now? I want you to think about something. If I put a finish on this violin and it's bare wood, usually these would have been very light colored wood, and I put the material on now, then I wonder if it's soaked in uniformly to now. You have to understand, everything is transitional. Loading, the application of this, and within that transitional soak-in time zone, whatever you want to call it, let's call it transition, there is an opportunity to build strength and durability through a transition layer. And it is my understanding that they use something that they called ground. I don't know what that means. I know what ground is. If I go outside and walk on it, it's the ground. I have a sneaking suspicion uh, cover uh, which brought me to doing some very rookie level investigation and somebody did an electro scanning microscope or whatever they call it and looked at some of these old violins and figured out it's possible that they used a mineral substance, which where I come from is called dirt. So we are actually going to finish this guitar with dirt. Believe that or not. I promised you we would talk a little about loading and structure. I'm very fascinated by that. So, you know this little violin will crank out some noise. It doesn't have pickups. Um, it loads and it's far more efficient at loading than this guitar right here. And let's talk about why. This, get, this violin, excuse me, would have a bridge about this big. You see that? 
It sits up off of the deck of the violin. It fits the violin perfectly. It has to. If it, the feet don't sit right and you load this thing, it's going to develop cracks right here. Remember, this is really thin. Okay? So, when you load the bridge on a violin, that means you're pulling and you're bowing. You're not just taking your finger and popping it or plucking it or dragging it out. There's only a certain level of loading you can get on a guitar in comparison to a violin. So what ends up happening is it pushes down and wants to roll forward and it goes to a post inside the violin. When it's released, it releases the vibrations. The vibrations go inside and they come out the F holes. That's the way it works. Now, I think you can see this, this is on a bigger one. This is on from a giant violin, I want to give a shout out. You know, when I was in probably junior high, seventh grade, I was in music class. I was going to be the world's greatest musician. But for some reason, I got picked out. I think they blamed it on behavior. I don't know what the issue was. But he actually, the music teacher put me in a closet. And when I was in there, I felt around, there was a giant violin in there. So I started playing the giant violin I was pulled out, my music career ended, and now I'm left to doing this. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, I'll leave it at that. You can go ahead and live the lie. Um, anyway, you see it here. It sits here. This whole thing loads. It's big. It releases, and you get sound. Now, would you believe that this floating bridge and this violin bridge this one's very tiny. This one will produce a lot more sound, um, even though it's loading into a much deeper body. You see that? So when we load this, this guitar, if I can stand up, the string... violin will outperform this all day long. So what's the point? Well, the point is you see this model. Do you see it is the same model that Mississippi Joe Calicott is playing on the front cover of George Mitchell's book, Mississippi Hill Country Blues, 1967. George, you're an awesome person. Your work is awesome. Your writing is awesome and your photographs are awesome. But the whole thing is when you load the sound hits the soundboard. That's why they call the front a soundboard. It goes inside the guitar and radiates out. Now, part of maximizing that is not to have the wood being soft because, number one, it will break. Over time, can you imagine a violin that had no treatment? It was just the thin wood. It would absorb moisture. It would dry out everything. You have to seal it. So part of sealing it is about durability, and the other part is about creating a barrier that keeps sound in. Because if you don't have that barrier built into the wood of the guitar, most of your resonance just escapes right off the surface. So it's the seal that keeps everything in and directs it out. That is the most rudimentary and ridiculous explanation I have ever made up about how music works. Now. The point is, we're going to get to the bench here, and I'm going to show you how I do this. I'm going to show you the ingredients. You're not going to believe it. I'm going to have to provide forensic truth. But we are going to take our Mississippi mudslide. We are going to put a coating on it that provides that sealing and durability I'm talking about. But we have to put something on that to create a transitional zone that number one protects the guitar and allows for the application of other things that are going to give the guitar its color and ultimately its protection. We are actually going to use Mississippi River water and Mississippi dirt to provide this effect. Believe it. Okay, I almost forgot. Safety first. We are going to be using chemicals, some of them very dangerous chemicals. So, you want to protect your eyes at all times. Next, you want to protect, do not expose your skin to these dangerous chemicals. And then finally, 
Some of these chemicals send off vapors, not the particular ones, just chemicals in general. And I have been told when using chemicals that put off vapors, you may want to use a laboratory hood. Check. Oh, remind me not to tell you the story about Dr. Newman and lactophenol. Don't even go there. Anyway, we're ready. Let's go to my laboratory, formerly known as the shed. Okay, let's get a couple things out of the way first. Anyone who has a Paul Miro junk pile guitar pocket protector, yeah, Google that episode, is going to think that this t-shirt from my friends at Kremer Pigments is the coolest thing you've ever seen. And it is. So, Kremer Pigments. What a wonderful tote bag here. Kremer Pigments has been supplying artists with pigments and all this scrap apparatus that you see here that I'm not sure what any of it is. Anyway, Kremer Pigments. From Kremer Pigments we have potassium silicate. We have ground mineral, mineral ground material, mineral ground material from, you're not going to believe this, from Deke Rivers, my friend Deke Rivers. We have Mississippi River water that was chlorinated in my own laboratory, I mean shed. Yes, I do expect you to believe that this came from the Mississippi River. In fact, watch it right now, doubter. Mississippi River water. My good buddy Ken in California, he needs this. And doesn't that look yummy? Mm -mm, so clear, water's clear, you can almost see through it. Uh huh. What did I tell you? Yeah, pigs say that when you kick them. What do you got to say now? And then, since, yeah, I had to save this one for last because this is completely and utterly disamazing. This is actually clay dirt out of the hill country of North Mississippi, dug straight out of Sardis, Mississippi, cultural capital of the world. And I know you don't believe me, so one more time. Here's the proof. Ken asked me to go do some digging, and I'm not exactly sure why, but we're about to go and, and do it anyways. I've got my shovel and a little old teapot that we're gonna be putting something into. Teapot. He asked for me to dig some Mississippi mud. Not exactly sure why, but we're gonna do it anyways. We've got a spot here in the hillside with some good red Mississippi clay mud. All right, let's see what we can get here. Some nice, nice sticky red clay. good sticky stuff now so the first thing we're going to do is take this yeah whatever it is and we're going to take some of this mississippi clay coming out of this hermetically sealed whatever it is and we're going to put it in said sifting device 
going to very carefully measure about that much. And set this aside. This will be available for sale or financing on easy payment terms. Next, we're going to turn this. No, this is not something you've seen your grandma do. This is something new and improved here. But we're going to sift this down like so. We're going to come up with that. Do you see that? Do you see the consistency of that? Now, we're going to transfer this very carefully using said conveyance device into here. This is very heavy because it's clay in price. Now, we take Mississippi River water, make a sludge by pouring this in here, not too much. Now, Chick Flick Teal Pointer Junior, not to be confused with Chick Flick Pointer Senior, has graciously offered to sacrifice life and limb to stir said sludgy something or other like so. That's starting to look like a mud pie. Here we go. Do you see the motion? Do you see that? Now, it's a little bit watery. We need it to be not watery. So we're going to put another one, two. No, you cannot lick the bowl. Off to our mineral ground material. One, two, no, that's not cream of tartar. There we go. And we again go with the agitation. It's a moderate agitation, not an agitation like listening to my voice, but a moderate agitation like so. Now we will take a resulting sludge. We will put it in this jar. This is not a moonshine jar. We'll pour our sludge in here. It's already starting to thicken up on the bottom. That is what we want. Believe me, we will take our scoop, transfer that like that. Again, very scientific. We want this to have the consistency of mud. The kind you drag in the house after a good rain. And we're going to scientifically agitate the mixture, like so. Then we're going to meter it out into this Noxzema bottle. Don't worry, Grandma's not missing it yet. And there we go. We are ready to rock and roll. Okay, guys, let's quit playing around now. Here's what's going to happen. I am going to take one of my wipe all. Remember, we sanded this. We put a lot of effort into this in episode two where nothing's going to hang up. We're going to get all the dust off of here. Nothing hangs up. You see that. Very little dust. This thing is dustless. It catches dust. These paper towels are incredible. They're 17 cents a piece, but that's the price of incredibility. We've got everything padded. We're going to work on the back first. So what's going to happen is this potassium silicate is a clear liquid. I want you to find out what this stuff is. Just don't go out and buy it. Find out from Kremer chemicals, Kremer pigments, excuse me, what this stuff is, how you get it. When you order something from them, they send you an MSDS sheet, material safety data sheet. It tells you what to do, what, what the stuff is, what the hazards are. You want to do that. This is not time to play around. But what's going to happen here? is this is going to soak in and we're going to rag it on. We're not going to use a brush. We're going to rag it on. Now notice I have a couple of rags here. And while it is still wet, we're going to also rag on this sludge and we're going to leave it sit until it dries overnight. So let's watch this happen. This stuff is not stuff you want on your hands. I don't think it's really really dangerous but 
again, we're going to agitate it, making sure I have a couple bottles of these. I want to make sure the top seal wasn't. Once we get going here, we do not want to stop. So, we are going to, there we go. Now, don't expect any radical color changes immediately, but let's get the hard stuff out of the way first. That's up here where the Florentine cutaway is. Again, we are, we talked about the theory of stuff soaking in. Notice the wood starting to pop. There's a slight odor to this stuff. It's a tad gelatinous, but it is soaking down into the wood. I want to make sure that I got all of it. I want to make sure that there's not a ton of it somewhere over here in a pool of it here. Again, I'm working with the grain like so. I'm just going to wipe this on like this. I'm going to keep the camera on so you can see what's happening. Set that down. Now notice that there's not a bunch of dirt coming off on the wipe wall. Get that completely out of the way over here and give it one more wipe. I can feel this stuff drying already. It's getting tacky. I'm not going to try to do the sides and the top and like that. We're going to make sure that the drop down is good. Now I'm going to agitate this. Remember, clay drops out. It's heavy. If you do a texture test, the clay takes 24 hours to drop out. But again, we don't want to play around. We're going to be liberal with this, not like liberal Kansas, but liberal, yeah, I've been there, liberal Kansas, cultural capital of the world. We're going to put this stuff on here. We're going to try to do it evenly, but there's our mud, okay? Now there's bits and pieces of dirt in here. We don't care about that. You just want to make sure it gets everywhere. See that? Now I can feel the potassium silicate starting to harden up already, so I want to move right along here. Don't worry about the mud chunks and all that. We're, we're not going to worry about that. Remember, there's a transition taking place. The stuff is drying down in the wood, creating a barrier, and it's also providing us with a transitional layer that will accept a finish. It's going to be right there along with the ancient stuff that we're doing here. Now, again, we're just going to make sure that everywhere we look, everywhere you look at, what was that show? I hated it. There okay, we go. Now this stuff is hardening up already. You can see it. I'll leave this sit. seal everything up now. We are going to just leave this dry. You can see it was starting to paste up already. We're going to take another rag for the appropriate chemical reaction. I think you need a chick foot teal rag, but we're going to round the binding and make sure that there's no big chunks left on the binding. This binding on this guitar was really, really nice. I know you think I just ruin the guitar, but I'll tell you what the strategy here is. I said it was a junk pile to begin with, right? So leave that alone. Let it sit overnight.
Okay, guys, this is the part where you're going, dude, what did you do? Relax. Now, I want you to check it out. Look at my sandpaper collection. I got every kind of grit there is marked in here. And I can just take a piece. Now, you remember the 1,200 grit sanding blocks and everything that we had? Look at that. It drops right back in there. I don't have to dig around. I'll just close this up. And... Bingo, put it away. I've got 1200 grit sandpaper here. And it literally looks like I drug this through the mud. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take this plastic putty knife and we're just going to go along. And you can see the potassium silicate piles up in spots. You're going to see that as you go along. But anyway, we just scrape some of this off. That's a good idea to kind of try not to get as much of this in the guitar again. I've got a really cool vacuum that I use. It blows everything out, but you can see it piled up in here. Now, had we not done all that work, it would be much worse, but now it's just simply taking 1,200 grit paper and knocking that stuff off. Whenever you see something piling up right there like that, Save yourself some time. You know it's going to be down in here where that drop down is where the arch starts building up in the guitar. It'll be right there. Do you see that? Just push that off. Work with the grain of the wood. Don't use something that, that is going to scratch everything up. But you have to be able to tell by working on this. This thing has built like a like a, almost like a layer of concrete or something down in there in the wood that makes it violin-like. So, sound trapped inside. If this was purely an acoustic instrument, that would really help. But you are going to be able to push your nail into this. It's like the wood is sealed now. I'm going to get all this sanded off, and you're going to see... It's going to look just like that until we put the final secret ingredient on. Anyway, I got a lot of work to do here. You just bang away. Again, the payoff for the work you did up front, starting with the people in the factory that didn't send me some roughed up thing that was like a rough two by four. I didn't have to do that much work here. So now is when all that's going to pay off. Again, when you start seeing stuff coming up that looks like a circle or something, you just come in here. Knock that down. You're going to get this all the way, what it looks like, back down to the grain. Now, if you get a couple little spots that are calcified, because that's what's really happening here, you just get out your scraper like this. And knock that edge down like that. Just go with the grain. These things are handy. The ones with the radiuses are really handy. But, yeah, you've got calcification going on here. That is what's going to seal up the guitar. Okay. go. Again, I can't tell you how important the prep is if you're going to start doing things like this. Believe it or not, we're getting close and I'm going to take an awl and go back to all those little holes I drilled and make sure they're opened up. And we'll be good to go. All right, guys, now we're getting down into the final details. We want to take an awl and get to those holes that we pre-drilled right there. Mm -hmm. There we go. Now, I want to show you something really cool. You need one of these if you don't have one. It's a blower, it's a vacuum, it's everything. You need one of those. So, we're done. How does it look? You like that? Does that look impressive to you? Yeah, I'm thinking not. Because 
There's one more ingredient. It's the secret ingredient. It's very rare. Um, are you ready? I'm going to take a lintless cloth and put in this magical stuff here. Watch what happens. Oh, look at that. Does that look like Mississippi mud? Look at that pop too. Should I tell you what this stuff is? Maybe you already know. Maybe you've used it before. Maybe it's... That's right, boiled linseed oil. That's right. So what has happened here is we have sealed the wood. Um, that potassium silicate bonds like basically cement. So there's a layer of wood that is basically calcified. Have you ever heard of that? Like petrified wood, right? And so while it was still wet, remember we talked about a transition zone, wetting pattern, all that kind of thing. Kind of like how water moves through soil, same type of thing. Soil is pulling it down. There's capillary action, all that kind of thing. But while the well, the ground mineral ground is working in, and while the Mississippi clay, which goes right with the mineral ground. While that's coming on, you have the transition zone. Now, what's going to happen is this is going to dry. Okay? You notice the rag isn't hanging up anywhere. It's nice and smooth. We're going to put a bunch of coats on here. And um, what do you think of that? I'm happy with that. Thank you, Cody and Deke, and my friends at Kramer Pigments. And the ancient violin maker from the 1700s that I'm channeling right now. All right, guys, we're ready to do the neck now. I've taken my love pencil and I've put this piece of metal on here and we're going to talk about the theming about that but I've gone around and kind of marked out where that is and then I'm going to take these chick flick teal screws you can always tell where I've been working because there's chick flick teal screws now you might be asking yourself where do you get chick flick teal screws? And the answer is, yeah, that's right, from the chick flick teal screw get in place. So I'm going to pop these off of here. And then I am going to take this neck and touch up these corners here on the belt sander so everything matches up and then we're going to do the neck the same way we did the body because we want it all mat to match i'll see you in a few all right so we've rounded that off roughed it up a little bit we don't want it looking like a new guitar we've taken the back of the net everything neck everything the holes are drilled this is for relic wood. We'll cover that in the theming. And then we've put our spot for a nickel right there. And because the neck is radius, we've had to do a little bit of this with a good chisel. Take care of your chisels, okay? So now we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We are going to use 
potassium silicate right here. Coat that first, and while it's wet, we are going to use our Mississippi mud. Got to shake it because the clay drops out. So I've taped off the neck joint where everything glues in. I don't want that, anything but bare wood against bare wood, and looked at where the fretboard is going to touch. Everything covered that up. I don't want any finish on the fretboard. We're going to do something good with that, but we're also going to do this part. So here we go. All right, same as with the body. We take some 1200 grit paper once everything is dry and we sand down, get rid of the rough stuff until you can see the grain popping through. Again, potassium silicate followed by mineral ground mixed with Mississippi clay mud into chlorinated Mississippi river water and wiped on to everything now. Again, it's 1200 grit sandpaper, just like that. All right, guys, it is official. Tammy has signed it. She signs all my guitars. If you have one of my guitars and you don't have this, then it's not one of my guitars. So, let's get on to the next part, which is taking our rag. You see how this is lint-free? It's like a microfiber. Um, I cut it, so there is a little bit of lint coming off of here. But um, it works really good. We're going to do the same thing we did before. We're just going to put linseed oil on the rag like so and watch the magic happen ooh look at that nice of course this is going to be covered up with uh, a top is going to be covered up with part of an old metal can okay but just like this let's scoot this back so you can see what's happening I'm going to dab this on here so Tammy's signature stays without smearing. She just got it done there. Now, I want to tell you about another, while I'm doing this, again, it was important that we covered up the fretboard because I'm going to sand down the top of the fretboard. Let me not get sidetracked here. You see that? Like so. And I also covered up all the glue surfaces. I already said that. I want you to pay attention to that. Come over here on the side. I really, really like the detail work that was done on this before it hit me. It made all the difference when it comes to finishing. Now, while I'm doing this, let me tell you another little 
scientific trick. Um, do you know how to start a fire without a lighter or matches? Okay. Yeah, you got them flint things and some uh, char cloths, which is made by burning a cotton material with no oxygen and, and all that. But um, I know another way. It's a really easy way, and it builds the greatest fire. Um, you see this rag right here? Do you know how boiled linseed oil dries? It doesn't air dry, it oxidizes. Do you know what else oxidizes? Yeah, fire. So, I'm going to take this nice soft rag. I'm just going to wad it up like this. And the linseed oil is going to oxidize. And it's going to heat up. And because the rag isn't stretched out like this, where it can heat off into the atmosphere, it's going to start to smolder. And then I'm going to come out in the middle of the night, and I'm going to find that my whole shed is on fire because this will smolder enough to where it catches on fire and poof. So guys, I kind of fooled you here a little bit and played around, but this is no joke. If I leave this rag sit right here, I guarantee you, if my shed is not burned down in the morning, I will come back and see that this is all charred on the inside. That is the downside to boiled linseed oil. You want to take these rags, you want to lay them out, wet them, and then dispose of them properly. A fireplace is a good place to do that, but do not ever leave boiled linseed oil rags wadded up sitting anywhere because the minute the sun comes up and it gets hot in the shop, woof. All right, we're going to put a few more coats of oil, linseed oil on the body and neck of this guitar. Let it dry between coats. And please do not forget what I just told you about these rags. You want to make sure that they're not getting any oxygen when they're drying out. They're not all wadded up somewhere. And they are in a place that does not heat up because you will burn your shed down and your insurance company will not be happy about it because they'll figure it out and they'll say it says right on the can that this stuff is an oxidizer. All right, let's close this out. All right, guys, I could not be happier with the way this turned out. It sounded wacky, but you know what? I like building authentic, individual, and durable. Don't you hate it when people do this? Especially if their guitar doesn't look like this one. Anyway, now we're gonna get into the fun. We're gonna glue the neck on. We're gonna dress this thing up. We're going to put everything on it that makes it individual. There's gonna be a great history lesson there. And then we're gonna put on the hardware. We gotta find somebody to play this thing. So, um, this episode about finishing this guitar, putting the finish on it, is over. I'm going to tell you that I really need to thank a few people. Number one, my friends at Kremer Pigments. Kremer Pigments. Um, all, to, be, to put all the joking aside and everything, when you order products from these people, they email you MSDS sheets. That stuff I told you about the boiled linseed oil is real. And it's really important, the products you use, always look at the MSDS sheet, always look at the warnings. It's really easy to go to a computer. Uh, most of these things have a scan code on them now. You just pop it up. What am I breathing? What am I doing? What do I do if something happens? You don't want to burn your shed down. Imagine 200 years tourists coming here and saying, this is where Paul Miro Junk Pile's guitar stood until it burned down over a rag with boiled linseed oil on it. I don't care how nice this finish is, but I would really hate to have a fire and lose that tin of Mississippi clay that I have. I want to say thank you, number one, to Cody Harrell. Cody, you have been a friend of this channel for a long time now. 
Uh, you've got a few of my guitars and you're playing black background music all the time and everything and I so appreciate that. Deke Rivers, the River Water Collector, thanks, couldn't have done this without you. Uh, the success on this is really, and the authenticity actually go to Cody and Deke. So, that said, um, guitar kit world, your ES-175 kit is working out pretty well thus far. And next episode, we're going to bolt this neck on and see what it does and see how the frets look. And we're going to dress all that up. And then we're going to get in to theming. And you are going to be completely and utterly disamazed. So until then...